morning, everybody, or it's good morning where I am, but it's probably good evening or good afternoon where you are. So welcome to this webinar um, uh, on how you can move to Australia. It's as simple as that, really. Amazing time to move to Australia. Borders are open. COVID's sort of kind of in the past, and the economy is just wanting people. So there's a massive backlog that didn't come in over the last couple of years, and now is an amazing time to, to move. And we're going to tell you why and how, and I've got some expert panellists. My name is Scott Matheson. I'm from Working in Australia. We've been doing this for over 20 years. We love what we do. We want people to come to Australia and contribute. So thank you for joining us. We're going to be 40 minutes of lots of information. So you can see how you can get there. It's as simple as that. We're not mucking about today. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our two panellists, uh, Nazim Lalazari from Western Sydney. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, our migration expert. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nassim. I'm a registered migration agent. I studied law at UWS, now called a different university, now in Western Sydney. Um, I've been with working in for 11 years, and over that time I've helped literally thousands of migrants make the move to Australia. So looking forward to chatting to you all today. Thank you, Nazim. And over in the UK, uh, our resident expert there, our journey manager extraordinaire, Paul Goddard. Hi, everyone. Yeah, great to see everyone on here. Um, I guess a lot of you on here today are looking at, you know, getting a better lifestyle and um, looking for that, that really good work-life balance and, you know, moving down under, as they say, is what can give you that, you know? Um, I know from my own experience, um, you know, I didn't move to Australia. I did move to New Zealand, but, um, you know, it, it is... They're both similar countries in the way that they work with that work sort of balance, life, ethic, outdoors, lifestyle, the beach, etc. And if that's what you want, then you're in the right place and we'd love to help take you on that journey. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. So let's just cover off a little bit about what we're going to be covering on uh, covering today. So um, just a really quick overview of where we are with the borders um, and uh, especially immigration. Um, where do you start? Because you've got to start somewhere. Um, can you make the move? That's really important. You don't want to waste your time if you can't, but you also want to know if you can, because that just gives you so much momentum and energy and a, and, and a sense of direction. Um, how do you make the move, especially if you're, um, you know, not, um, not right if you're not actually able to meet all the points on the main on the main categories, and um, you know a little bit of chat, so we've got a chat going. Uh, Nazim's uh, going to be answering if she can. If we can't answer all your questions live, we'll certainly ask them, uh, answer them afterwards. Okay, so we'd we'd like to keep this really simple and brief. We, we can't answer everything to do with Australian immigration in 40 minutes. That's impossible. Treat this as your starting post, your stick in the sand, whatever you want to call it. But what we're all about is giving people a pathway, a little bit of momentum, and showing you that there is a way that you can actually move down here. A little bit about us, not too much, but we're a reasonably sized team. We're, this is our, these are our Australian people. We're a team of 60 people um, around the world. We've been doing this for over 20 years. It's what we love doing. And um, we're really, really only interested in, in, in giving you the, the, the opportunity to, to move down. So um, I'm going to just uh, introduce you to Nazima again, because she's actually a migrant herself. And she comes from the situation where she knows exactly what it's like to be a migrant, everything that's involved with it. Not only has she been in the industry for one and a half decades, but um, you know, her whole family has been through this this process, and I think that experience is invaluable. Nazim. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, so, for those of you that might not know, my parents um, moved to Australia as skilled migrants from the US. So, uh, my parents met and married in um, in Chicago, as you do back in the seventies. <laughs> um, so they met, got married. My father had a, a master's in computer science, which was a big deal back in the day. Um, and that meant that it was quite easy for my parents to um, move as skilled migrants to Australia. So that photo, and that's me being held by someone that I call an auntie now, um, is, is taken the day that we landed in Sydney. So that photo is taken in Hurstville after, I think it used to be 
like a two-day trip to get to Australia. So <laughs> um, my parents were quite exhausted. Um, so that's my mum holding the, the bag on the side and my dad looking all suave in his white coat. Um, so they made the move to Australia and I basically grew up in Australia, was able to go to school there. My brothers were born there. Um, we went to university, obviously, in Australia as well. And it's given, you know, me and my family all the opportunities that we've been able to have um, over the last several decades, giving away my age. So, um, you know, it's my family made that move and I, and I think it's amazing. And I know that, you know, all of our extended family would always talk about how we seem to have a great lifestyle. There was always pictures of us looking all smiley in warm weather, whereas they were dealing with snow and salted cars. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's great. And I highly recommend everyone who has been thinking about it to actually start that journey because, you know, you don't get to experience it if you don't start. Exactly. And look, what's most interesting about this is that Nassim's father moved out in the 70s because it was um, he had a job and his skill was in demand. And essentially nothing has changed over the last 30 uh, or so or 40 years. Um, uh, um, skills are, are the sort of singular main reason why Australia is trying to attract people. And uh, I guess that when we can segue now onto the Australian overview, um, I'll start off with this, but I'll get Paul to assist as well. But there's some really massive opportunities happening right now in Australia. And the, and the reason being is that there is low unemployment. Low unemployment was driven by COVID and the fact that so many people left Australia and went home. So March 2020, um, lots of people on 482 visas, which are temporary four-year visas, went back to the UK, went back to South America, went back to Canada um, to sort of, sort of isolate during COVID. And this created this massive shortage. Secondly, the Australian government has poured millions, billions of dollars back into infrastructure to get the economy going again. And suddenly people are needed. So there is a lot of competition, a lot of competition from employers trying to find the right people. So I can see in the chat here, people are saying, I'm a construction manager or I'm a psychiatric nurse. The reality is, is that um, there are skills in demand and and most employers are fighting for, for skills. The issue is how do you get through the process and how do you actually get through the very challenging Australian immigration system? So there are some barriers to overcome and maybe I can just um, uh, pass you over to Paul here to talk a little bit about the barriers that you typically face as somebody who's thinking about migrating. Paul. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the one of the main um, the things that people look at, I guess, and I'm just going back to my journey. Um, you know, I decided 20 odd years ago that I wanted to move to Australia and it was mainly because I'd watched neighbors on TV and I wanted a swimming pool in the back garden and it was nice and sunny all the time. And, and that looked wonderful. And so it was very much lifestyle driven. And then I started researching the immigration process. Now, 20 years ago, you're almost talking pre-internet <laughs> you know it was I'm, I'm getting old but I was reading books and I don't know if anyone can remember what books were but I used to read books about how to move to New Zealand uh, sorry to Australia and I did a lot of research on it or I thought I did and I learned the hard way that um, applying for a visa isn't as simple as filling out forms and answering questions okay because that's what I did even after reading books on doing this and talking to other people who'd moved to Australia I went that's me that's my occupation that's what I do this is what I need to apply for I went and did it and I got declined I lost my money quite a lot of money at the time and I learned the hard way that it's not as simple as just wanting a job offer seeing a great lifestyle and then filling out forms and waiting for a visa to be issued it's it's what you don't know that trips you up because everything in the background with immigration is constantly shifting all the time it's like a a desert that's just shifting sands as they say and unless you are completely up to speed with how things work and you know the stuff that only the australian government knows and and the people who are lodging visas like us on a daily basis if you go into that sort of process without help and support, it's an absolute minefield. And the chances of success are massively diminished um, by doing it that way, especially in this post 
post-pandemic world where things have changed even more. And that would be the big piece of advice I would share from my own journey. Yeah. So look, I mean, one of the um, lines that we have in that overview is how to avoid making costly mistakes. Um, we see it all the time, don't we? Um, you know, Nazim, maybe you just want to give us some examples of mistakes that people make, especially in terms of immigration and perhaps uh, looking at their skills and thinking that they uh, um, qualify for one visa and then they go down this line. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just as an example of one, you know, of what can happen, um, maybe you could give us some examples of what people should be looking out for. Yeah, I think the first thing is that people need to understand what their journey looks like. So every occupation has different criteria. So I think I saw someone early on who said they were a construction manager. So the terms that we might use um, in Australia for migration purposes will be different to what they might be um, based on where you live and work, your experience, your qualifications. So in general, construction project managers in Australia must have a bachelor's degree. It has to be a bachelor's degree and then experience on top. So we had an individual who got really excited, was actually someone in a similar role, had started their own process, um, had lodged a visa on the basis that they believed they could call themselves a construction project manager, um, and they didn't actually meet the criteria for the subclass that they had applied for. And so unfortunately, that, I shouldn't be laughing, but that unfortunately in that instance, that person's visa was refused, and they basically had to go back and restart the process again. So it's really important that everyone understands based on what I do and the job offer that I've been offered, which visa subclass can I apply for? Do I meet the criteria for that subclass? Because a construction project manager will need something for a 189 that's completely different to a 482. And so because of that, you might meet one and not the other. But if you start down the wrong road, you're going to be wasting money um, to not get the outcome, which is the visa that you're looking for. So I think it's really important that before you get too invested and you start going off and doing things that you actually understand what you can call yourself for migration purposes and what that's going to include. Okay. Once you've got that, you've got your roadmap and you can focus on, you know, the bits that need doing. Yeah. Yeah, so look, I think it's like any journey, whether it's a car journey or, or, or a holiday or whatever, you just want to do your planning first. I guess that's what we can assist you with uh, and the Seams team will, will, can assist you with is um, understanding not only you know what your occupation is and how it fits in with the system, but also where do you want to live? What you know? What do you want out of it? Are you single? Do you have a partner? Do you have children? Um, and there's all these other aspects to it that we won't go into now. But Nazim, I, 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 I'm hoping you're not confusing everybody here. I'm assuming that a lot of people do already understand the different subclasses, but I also assume that these numbers will mean nothing to a lot of others. So can we just quickly go through the main subclasses? Yeah. And, 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 and really, which these are the main routes or the main categories by which you can migrate. Some of them don't even require a job offer um, if, you, if you meet the requirements. So um, let's put that up on screen if we can have that. Yep, fantastic. That's coming up. Nazim, if you could just run through this, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so we're, we're talking more specifically about the skilled pathway. So these subclasses relate to those that would be migrating based on their skills. Um, so the subclass 189 is what we call, you know, your, the ultimate goal. It's your, your golden visa. It's the first place one. It's because of the fact that you've got skills that are in the highest demand list. You don't need a job offer and you're not restricted to where you might live in the country. So a subclass 189 is a points-based visa. You need to have a specific occupation. You do need to be under 45 for this particular visa subclass. Um, and it, once it's granted, you get permanent residency and you can live anywhere in the country. The next one down is the subclass 190. And so your occupation might be on the same occupational list as the 189, which is the MLT SSL, or your occupation might be on the short-term list or the STSOL. Um, but in this case, for this particular subclass, although also points based and although also has the 45 year age limit, you do need one of the states or territories to nominate you to be eligible. So a lot of people might go for this particular subclass because of the fact that it's a priority um, a visa subclass. 
Um, you don't need as much points to get selected and to move through the process. But as part of that, you're sort of committing to the state that's offered to sponsor you. So it's a that's the trade-off. The next one yeah. down. Can I, just, can I just pause you there before you jump into the, the, the other subclasses? So what you've just um, gone through there are the, are the two main subclasses, the 189 and the 190. The 189 is kind of gives you the opportunity to be independent and live and work wherever you choose. Once you've got that visa, it's a, it's a, it's a permanent residency visa. Uh, I'm just making sure that I understand this. And then the 190, well, you need to be nominated by a state. And once you get um, granted that 190, you need to go and live in the state that granted you that, that opportunity for a period of time. Yeah, so again, it's permanent residency for the 190 and yeah, you're you're making a commitment to live in that state. Yeah, okay. So, and, and but the, the, the really interesting thing about both these visas is that you may not need a job offer in order to get to apply. Correct, it's not a mandatory um, requirement of those subclasses. Fantastic. But the next one's the 494 and the 491. So um, those are more yeah. your regional visas. So um, the, um, as this pops up, I'll just say that, so the, the first two are, are more, in, you know, refer to the whole country or the whole of the state. Um, the regional visas are just that, they're referring to a regional part of those, of the country or state. Um, and the idea being is that it's trying to encourage you to go and help with the, the growth of specific parts of Australia. So um, as you can appreciate, everyone wants to live in the major cities and towns, um, but Australia's got a huge need for people and skills everywhere. And so these one, these particular subclasses, the 494 and the 491, are more like a, um, a provisional visa. So it starts off as provisional residence and then subsequently becomes permanent residence. The reason being is that they want you to stay living and working in those areas um, for longer because they know that once you're there, you'll be settled and you're less likely to leave and you'll continue to work, pay tax and, and grow those communities. So that's the that's the difference. With the skilled employer, obviously you've got an employer and that, that suggests that you've got a job offer. So that's different to the other subclasses. Okay, so there's a lot going on there, but basically the way I read it is um, 189, 190, no, no job required if, you're, if your skills and occupation are of the standard and meet the standard on the lists. Uh, but there are other opportunities, regional opportunities, and um, you haven't talked about the 482. Um, and I mean, that's quite a popular visa as well. And maybe you just want to cover that off, Nazim, which is not on that list. Sure, just really quickly, the subclass 482 is um, a, a work visa. It's a temporary work visa. It's um, employer sponsored and it can be granted anywhere from one day to four years. Normally it's um, applied and issued for two or four years. So for that, you obviously need a job offer. Um, so everything in Australia that requires a job offer is employer-led. So that would mean that the employer has to do a certain part of the process and then you also then apply for your visa. So some 482s will lead to permanent residency, but not all of them. Yeah, so those are, those are um, like you say, they're temporary visas. We're very much here around permanent residency. We're um, interested in helping people move to Australia permanently and most of what we're discussing here today is around how we can how, how we can do that um, and so you know what Nazim was talking about was the Australian job market we've sort of touched on that before but unemployment rate is dropping to historic lows there's massive skill shortages of hospitality and the mining and construction engineering healthcare um, and, and the list goes on and more and more employers are looking offshore so it actually genuinely is a, an amazing time to start the move, but how do you start the move? <laughs> Where do you start? Um, we, 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 we talk about putting a, um, a stake in the ground because Paul, you know, we've had chats with so many people, haven't we, who've spent hours and hours on the internet, um, not really kind of getting anywhere. And somewhere along the line, you've just got to go, right, enough's enough, I want to move. I need to make the first step and get some traction. Paul, can I leave this up to you? Because I think you explain it really well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just looking at everyone in the chat room now. And um, 
you yeah. know they're, they're really good skills and really good 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 things and you can tell they're just kind of itching and going so how do I do this <laughs> and you know and if you were all sat in a room with me right now I'd sort of say look gather around and let's explain how this works because getting started it doesn't matter you know obviously your individual skills and all that are all really important but getting started isn't getting the visa getting started is getting clarification on your route forward you need a roadmap you you need a you need steps to follow if you haven't got a clear way forward what are you going to do you're going to use the internet and you're going to spin round and round in circles sucking up hundreds of hours reading conflicting information missing the really important information that you really need and potentially like i did wasting a hell of a lot of time and money going in the wrong direction the first step the way that you get started the way you put that stake in the ground is you've got to find out what is your personal roadmap to new zealand what is your visa path you know what is the journey that you're going on because it's only by getting that clarity that you can literally visualize, you know, if I do this, this and this in this way, that's how I get from here to here. How many people on this call right now, if you if you're listed and you can type, yes, I know how many people know the answer to that question with absolute clarity? You know, it won't be many. And even the people who think they do actually probably don't, you know, so that's the first step with us. We can give you your visa path to New Zealand. It's not just about, uh, sorry, to Australia. Yeah. It's, not, it's not just your, um, not New Zealand. It's not your, um, it's not just about visas. It's about your journey. How do you get from where you are to where you want to be? You do that by following certain steps, going through certain processes. As we just highlighted, it's an absolute minefield with Australia. You've got different states. You've got multiple different visas. You've got different occupations with different requirements for different visas at different times. And, you know, how does it work? You need personalised information that's all about you and your move. And how we do that is we get information from you. We run it past Nazim and the Australia team. They will clarify everything. They'll get all the information they need from you. They'll put together a report. They'll email you the report. That report is going to outline what your actual options are and the ways forward. And then on top of that, you're going to get a call with a consultant who's going to sit down and map that journey out with you over a Zoom call. That is absolutely essential. It's a really simple first step. All you've got to do is fill out an online form, send us all the details, send us your CV. That's it. You've put a stake in the ground and you're ready or you're a lot further forward than you are right now. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so um, there, we do have a slide here about the first step. Um, so how do you make the move? Well, the first step, as Paul's just said, is um, we have a free appraisal. Um, we'll ask somebody to actually put that in the, um, in the online chat. Uh, if, you, if you click on that appraisal, um, as I said, it's free, um, and one of our team will look at that and just give you a really clear idea of whether you can move to the next level. Um, and so we've been in this so long, we've been doing this for so long, we just want to give people clarity. We're not really about, I guess, bending the truth. We're about saying, hey, listen, you meet criteria or you don't, and if you don't, why don't you, and um, what do you need to do to meet that criteria? So there's a free eligibility assessment. And then what Paul talked about was the second part. Once you actually know that you've got a pathway, we'll ask you for more details and a full assessment. So um, maybe, Nazim, you can sort of describe what you'll be looking for in that full assessment a little bit more, because it is there is quite a lot involved with that full assessment, isn't there? Yeah, so the, that first appraisal is just for us to be able to get a snapshot of who you are and what you do. So based on your qualifications, your age, your work experience and your occupation, are you likely to, to meet the criteria? If it's yes, then we'll want to know everything about you, you know, the dates of what you've studied, when you started, when you finished, every qualification, every job offer, everything related to your family. Does your partner also have qualifications that we might want to consider what do they do? How old are they? Do you have any children? Is there anything stopping them from, you know, joining you as part of that process? So we really get down into the nitty gritty 
And we do all of that so that we can actually come back and say to you, right, we've looked at everything. This is your pathway. This is what we need to do next. And this is what it will look like. And, um, you know, I spoke to someone just a couple of weeks ago where they've got one lot of work experience under their belt and they're in the process of completing another qualification in something totally different. And so we said, right, if you stay on the path that you're on, this is what you can do and these are the things you need to consider. But if we're going to look at this new occupation, we need to start at this point in the future and these are all the things that that will allow you to do. So we gave them basically two roadmaps and said, which one do you think you want to do? Go and have a think, talk to your family, you know, because obviously they're going to be involved in that process and let us know. And so when you have that, <laughs> then you can actually proceed and go, right, you know, there's no point applying for jobs, for example, um, related to an occupation that I can't meet for immigration purposes. That would be a waste of, you know, not just your time, but the employer's time. You know, I need to either stick with what I'm doing now or I'll just wait and I'll come back in six months and, you know, then I'll start talking to employers. So I think it's really, really important that when we get to that second step that everyone provides all the information um, and in detail, because if we don't have that information, we can't give you that roadmap and we can't help you along that journey. Yeah, so I think the second part, so just uh, to, to, to be clear, the first part is free. Yeah. Um, and then the second part, there's a fee for it, Nazim, when, because that's the grunty part. Um, what do we charge, if you could remind us? Uh, it's in Australian dollars, it's $395. $395. And you get a 12-page report, at least, huge amounts of detail, but it is a roadmap. And included in that report, you get to speak to Nazim or Paul for an hour to explain it and ask any questions. So out of that 395 Aussie, basically what we that's that's what we talk about, about putting your stake in the ground. That's the start of the process. From that point on, whether you use us or not, I mean, obviously we hope you do, but you don't have to. Um, you've got your roadmap and that's your, that's, you don't need to go doing what uh, Paul talked about going around on the internet. You've just got this in your hand um, or on your screen because we've seen it as a PDF, of course. So, um, you know, that's, that, that's the start of your journey. Some people get this and they look at it and they go, okay, well, I'm not going to move for a year or two, but at least they know it can help you make the plan. And I guess what we see is that when people have this, have this booklet, have this report about their own personalised pathway to Australia, just it's really energy giving, just gives you that, um, I guess, the power and the confidence to say, wow, I can move, this is how, and now I've just got to do the, the next thing, um, which is, you know, uh, probably take on some of Paul's or, or, or Nazim's advice and, and get going. Um, look, it does cost, um, Paul, you know, I mean, cost is a big thing, but how do you talk? How do you talk about cost for people who are moving? Well, moving yeah. Over? yeah, look, look, you, you can't sugarcoat it. Um, cost is cost. It is what it is. Um, you know, the way it was once put to me, and I, I'll never forget it. Um, this was by an immigration advisor that I used. You know, twenty odd years ago, after I got declined, I actually learned the hard way, and then went to see an immigration advisor, and. You know, I never forget sort of going, wow, you know, there's a lot of cost involved here. And um, his, his response was great. It was like, yeah, but for the price of a decent car, you're getting a whole new life, <laughs> you know. And, you know, and, and we come across it. There are people who will literally be sat with a £20,000 car on their drive, umming and ahhing about spending less than that on changing their whole life. You know, it's like you spent more on your car than what, what, what you're going to spend here. And it doesn't make sense in a way. But when it comes to cost and when there's cost involved, the, the peace of mind aspect of it is what we do and how we do this. It's all about minimizing risks. That's why that initial assessment is free. There is no risk there at all. You've got to fill in a simple form and that's going to take you one step forward or it's going to clarify that you can't do it. And. You, you go and look somewhere else or do whatever. But that's simple. There's no risk to that. There's no cost at all. But when then when you move to the next step, which is having a full paid assessment, your visa path, your risk is already minimized because we've done the free bit, you know. And then when you do the visa path, if you're then go forward and go on to visas, your risk is minimized because we did the visa path. 
And that's what it's about. It's going through step by step. And that also minimizes your financial risk. Don't do what I did and go and spend the money when you don't know what you're doing <laughs> because you can lose it. I know because I did. So don't go the way I did. Go the way that we do it. And everything's about that. You don't have to understand visas in great detail. You don't have to do that things if you've got experts helping you do it. Let them do what they do. Follow their instructions. That's how you move to Australia. And that would be my real take on this whole thing today. If you want to go on this journey, do it in steps, minimize the risks, maximize the opportunities at every step. And step then step. every ball comes clear. Step by step. 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 Yeah. Look, and I think that makes it really challenging to say how exactly how much this is going to cost um, because every single people in this, you know, different hundreds of people on this webinar uh, have, a, have a different circumstance. Um, we don't know what your visa is. We don't know what your family situation is. You don't, we don't know if you're bringing children or a partner or if you've got an illness or you need something, you know. Or, um, and so if, every little thing has a, a bearing on the cost, not just of the visa, but the government fee, um, the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess what we're saying is we don't really want to tell you or, or, or go, hey, look, what, what does the ballpark cost? Because how long is a piece of string? Honestly, how long is a piece of string? That really just depends on each person. So, but we will be able to give you some indicative price once you've done your full, um, you know, my visa path, because that way we know how many people are involved, where you're going to go, what visa you qualify for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. It's just not a one-stop shop in terms of, you know, one size fits all for Australia. For any yeah, and if you're comparing us, you know, and if you, you know, if people on here are going to compare us and, and look at other agents and everything else, which people do, you know, that's fine. You know, our fees are in line with what other people charge. We're not extremely extortionally expensive. We're not cheap either. Um, okay. Our fees are there to enable us to do the job that we do. You know, but it's not just our fees you need to consider. It's what's the cost of getting to Australia? What's your cost of your shipping? What's the cost of renting a house? What's all that? That all becomes clearer in as part of the process of working with us. You know, um, we, we give them for, right? I, I think um, if I can just sort of cut across you there, because we've only got a few mm -hmm. minutes to go. But uh, once um, you know, I think a lot of people think, well, hang on, what's going to happen? I put my stake in the ground, I'm working on my visa, but then how do I get to Australia? I think one of the things that we would like to talk about is our relocation partners and how that can help, because that's the sort of stuff that you can start engaging with now, right, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. We've got relocation partners um, who can assist with everything from flights to shipping to banking to money transfers to everything else. And, um, you know, getting that information at the early parts of your journey this is what we call preparing for the move this isn't stuff you should be thinking out at the end <laughs> this is the stuff you need to know before you even commit you know and so we've got partners around all of that this is everything to do from employment support to visa support to relocation to support to general advice and support and it is really a one-stop shop and that makes us very very different to a lot of other agencies out there so when you look at other agents look at what they do and we already know that they don't do what we do in the way that we do it, or well, most of them don't, you know? Yeah, I think it's all true. All right, look, I'm, I'm really aware of the time. I can't believe how quickly this 40 minutes has gone, and I'm suggesting that probably in the future we might need to run them a little bit longer because, um, you know, you, you have talked a little bit about employment support there, Paul, um, and, you know, uh, we have an employment portal um, and we can help people guide them around around employment. We are working in Australia um, and um, we do have huge amounts of contacts in Australia. So I think it would be um, advantageous just to do your free assessment. We can at least give you some guidance and, and from there, no harm uh, and no risk, as you say. Nazim, do you have anything to add to all that? I'm sure you're probably going to say the same thing. I was, and I was going to be a bit cheeky and say, if anyone out there is a diesel fitter or hydraulics fitter, please make sure you complete that appraisal because we have an employer looking for your skills at the moment as well. Um, but really that first step, if everyone, you know, is actually interested in wanting to move to Australia and knowing if it's for them, the first step is that free online appraisal. And from there, you'll, yeah. you, know, you can move forward. 
And how long, Nazim, does it does the process take realistically for um, for, for residency? You know, it actually your... takes a while, and I think people need to understand that migration to Australia is not it's, it's not as simple and quick as they would like. You know, everyone decides I want to go to Australia, I want to go now. So if you want to move in like two years' time, you kind of need to start now because you've got one to make sure that you qualify, two you need to do all the steps along the way. And Australian migration is that you need to do something before you can apply for the next part of that visa process. And then once your visa is approved, you've got, you know, up to a year to activate your visa and you don't have to move for five. So, you know, you don't want to wait to the last minute and go, I'd like to be there tomorrow because that, that's not going to happen. Most people will need at least eight to 12 months as a minimum from the time they start before they'll physically be in Australia. Yeah, like I was gonna, I, I was gonna say, twelve months would be quite a conservative um, type of estimate. So, you know, if you are interested, start now because um, you know it does take it does take a long time. There's no question about that. And I think the second thing to add to that is because uh, Australia has essentially been closed for so long, the demand for Australia from people all around the world is now very strong, um, and a lot of people are making applications. A lot of people are wanting to move down there which will just put a, a, you know, a huge amount of strain on the immigration processing system. So you don't want to be at the back of that queue. You want to be near the front um, because we know that once um, these sort of government departments get full, then the, the, the time spans can really actually start to draw out. Um, and, yeah, so, so getting in there and starting early is the key to, to being um, in Australia down under in 2023. So look, it's 40 minutes is up. I really, as I said before, I can't really believe that so fast. I wish we could answer everybody's questions. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We really hope to see you down under. Fill in the free appraisal um, and let's get communicating and see how you go. All right. So thanks again and um, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.